And if you have a Bible, I am going to uh, read from the book of Philippians. Philippians is a letter in the, uh, in the New Testament. And we're going to start a brand new series this term. Okay, Philippians 1 says this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. <clears throat> so have you, um, have you ever been on a bus or walking down the road and you hear half a conversation? Maybe someone's on the phone or something and they're saying stuff on the phone and, and you're really not quite sure what's going on, but you're hearing half a conversation. Yeah, or... When I, was a, when I was a roofer, sometimes it used to get very boring, okay? When you had to carry loads and loads of stuff up the, up the ladder, or sometimes you had to get materials on the roof, and you used to have a rope. So some, one guy would be at the bottom of the, the scaffolding with a rope, tie the tiles up, and then rope it up, and then someone would be on the top, take the tiles off, spread it around the roof. But it got boring, right? So what used to happen now and again is that when the guy was down there on the rope and someone would walk past... You would start a conversation with them. And you'd say things like, so now the doctors give you that cream, has it all healed up? Or, or things like, um, okay, so now it's been removed. The doctor says, it, it, or will it grow back after, it's, uh, after you've had your surgery? And, 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 and like embarrassing things like, like, okay, so now it's been pierced. Have you got to sit down when you go into the bathroom? And things like this. And people are walking past and they're getting sort of half a conversation. When we come to the letters in the New Testament, right, we are getting half a conversation. All right? And what we've got to try and do is try and work out what the other half is and what the circumstances is. So we, we hear the conversation written in the letter, but also we know some of the history of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul planted a church in Philippi. Philippi, I think, is in Greece somewhere. Okay, Carl, is that right? That's official. Philippi is in Greece. There was a church planted there by the Apostle Paul, and, and Paul has been very busy planting churches all over the area, and he's basically got himself in trouble. When Paul preached the gospel in a town, there was either a riot or a revival. And at one time, Paul got arrested and, and he was mistreated and he ended up appealing to Caesar and then they put him in jail saying, all right, if you want to go to Caesar, that's where you're going, sunshine. And then for years, he was trapped in prison. Uh, and, and this is where, we, where he wrote this letter from. He's in prison. He's in jail. He's not playing his PlayStation in jail. Right? This is a grim, grim place, okay? And he's appealed to Caesar, and not sort of some kind of gracious, nice man. We're talking Nero, the one that absolutely loved murdering Christians, this self-seeking, weird man. And when we look at a, a book like uh, Philippians, we can think that it's got so many of these kind of standout verses. It's, not, it's, 
it's like made for posters, this, this book. There's these verses you can pull out and, and overlay on a picture of a kitten coming out of a chocolate box or something like that. Or there's loads of fridge magnet verses. Things like, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Wonderful stuff. But whatever were gains to me now, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. Fantastic. Or this one. Do not be anxious about every, anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Wonderful, beautiful verses. Many of us will have them written on the bottom of a card when we got baptized or sent through to encourage one another, and that is good and right to do. But it's all part of a conversation. And when we look at what, uh, what Paul is doing, he's writing to a church in Philippi. And it's interesting, when you compare it to other letters he's written in the New Testament, there seems to be this kind of personal, genuine personal affection that he has got for the people in this church. He's, he's not writing to talk about loads and loads of troubles that are happening in the church. He's not addressing it. He's not cross like he was with Galatians. And he's not like, dealing with issues that are like really weird in Corinth. It's like he's writing to people he really, really cares for just to put their mind at rest. That's what I'm saying. Listen, all this stuff that's happening to me, don't worry. It's all going to be all right. He's putting his friend's mind at rest and he's pointing them to the source of his confidence. So he's saying that whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, he's, he's basically saying, listen, I would rather be outside preaching, but the reality is now I'm chained up. I, I'm not able to go and, and, and do it. But he's, he f talks about joy so much in this. This geezer that's being persecuted, this fellow that's, that's trapped in prison talks about joy. Joy, more than anything, I think there's 16 references to joy in this short letter. Now, when you read through it, you find out he's, he's in prison, he's, he's talking about conflict, he's talking about suffering, he is facing probable death, but he's just got this abounding, please rejoice, he's going, rejoice. Now, how can he do that? And that, over the weeks, is what we're going to see. We're going to see how God gives joy to people in times of trouble. So how did he do it? Well, the first thing is this. There's this, this key sort of set of verses in Philippians 2 that we'll refer to pretty much every week that says that he made himself nothing. Talking of Jesus, he says, let your, let your attitude be the same as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing right in other versions it says it, uh, in the new living translation it says he gave up his divine privileges in the esv he says he emptied himself talking of jesus paul is saying that in a, a, in a consumer driven world which we live in now okay we, we it's all about me isn't it it's all about us you know it's like you go home and you have to, you know, you want to watch telly, but you don't just want to wait for the BBC to put what they want. You flick through Netflix to see, I want it now. You know, or you want to buy something and you go online and you, you're shopping around. I need this, I need that, I need the other. And, and you, you go shopping for clothes and you're thinking, right, eBay, what's my size? You know, and, you, and you're going through and it's, it's like all about me. When you're going to work, you're thinking, what's my wages? What do I deserve? You know, listen, I, I work harder than this one. It's all about me. Jesus, it wasn't all about him. He emptied himself. He gave up everything so that we could have everything. The trouble is when we start filling ourselves, we end up filling ourselves with rubbish. Well, I've got, I've got five kids and one grandson, okay? Easter time... Oh, my days. If, if they didn't buy Cadbury's, like, like, if they didn't buy Easter eggs for the head family, they'd have to put about three people out of work at Cadbury's in Birmingham, I tell you. We, we have eggs galore. So much chocolate. It's wonderful. It's great. But, but 
I think I know how much chocolate I want, right? And, and I know that, that I could just keep eating and eating and I could keep filling. And, and I'm, I'm on about my 17th, like, like crunchy Easter egg, and I can feel my arteries furring up as I'm actually swallowing, right? I don't know what is good for me. I think I do. And, and we do it in our lives, don't we? we? We feel like we've got to fill our lives with all sorts of stuff. And, and obviously, I need a decent wage. Obviously, a, you know, a relationship, sexual like relationship, that's what I need. I, I need to be in a position where I can call the shots and, I, and, I, and I'd like this and I'd like a holiday every year and I'd like this, that, that and the other. And we end up filling our lives with stuff that we think is going to be good for us. And we mess ourselves up time and time and time again. It seems that Paul has sussed this. And he allows himself to be filled up with hardships and difficulties. Not, not in some masochistic kind of way, like, I, I like pain. You know, not, not, none of this. He doesn't, he's not choosing it. He's not volunteering for it. But he recognizes that if God has put it in his path, if that's part of his destiny at the moment, then he trusts that God has got it in hand. And it's not just an opportunity just to sort of grin and bear it, but it's an opportunity to bring glory to God. And when you know in the midst of trouble that you are bringing honor to God, there really is joy in that. It's when you're in a hardship and you don't know the reason for it. It's when you're in a, a difficult situation and you think it's meaningless. When you know that you've got a God that loves you, that emptied himself and gave everything so that you can live life to the full, it might not feel like it, it might feel uncomfortable and not exactly what we volunteer for, but you can be guaranteed that you are given opportunity to bring glory to God. And you can rejoice in all the difficulties. <clears throat> when we find ourselves in these difficulties, we, we ask this question of ourselves. First tip, okay, of Philippians. First thing, how can I most glorify God in this relationship in this conflict, in this time of hardship, what must I do to honor God more than anything else? Not how do I get out of it? But what you don't see is Paul saying, oh, please pray that I'll get out of here. He sees it as an opportunity to, to, to honor God and to please him. And, and that brings dignity to our, our difficulties. And rather than squirreling out from underneath all the problems, he finds purpose within it. You see, God's more concerned with our righteousness than he is with our rights. He's more concerned with, with how we handle ourselves and how we live before him in the light rather than who's right or who's wrong. That's a very humbling thing if you end up in conflict with someone. It's, it's, it's easy to love your enemies, isn't it? Until you get one. You know, it's, it's like we have got opportunity in all the difficulties to reveal uh, God's goodness. So that, that's the first thing. He allows himself to be filled and trusts whatever circumstances come his way is in the sovereignty of God an opportunity to bring him glory. Second thing he, he, he does is this. is Verse 6, I'll read it. It says, being confident of you. This would make a good fridge magnet. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul's confidence is not in the sort of stoic resolve of the Philippian church. He's not confident that they're going to be able to sort of muscle their way through and grin and bear it. Come on, we can make it. They're going to kind of white knuckle their way through this trouble. No, he's not confident in them at all. What he's confident in is him that takes us through difficulties. His confidence is in him, not... He's, it's the same for us. It's not, it's not in us. It's not, he's not confident in the force of our character or our ability to cope. But if God started a work in you, then no matter what is thrown at you, you can handle. You really will be able to handle. I've, I've seen different church situations, like little church plants that started and it's very vulnerable and it just feels like a little, 
you know, like on, on uh, those uh, survival things when they just start to light a fire and they've just got a little bit of smoke. You go to some of these church plants and stuff and it just looks like they've got a little bit of smoke and they're blowing like anything to try and get it going. But once he started, once that fire started, it's fine. If God started a fire in your soul, then no matter what is thrown at you, he will complete it. When I was... Um, it's, it might shock you to know. When I was a younger man, I was a naughty boy, right? And I used to love fire. And I used to love fireworks, okay? And I discovered there was, a, there was a, a gun shop, right, in Brighton where I lived. And they used to sell these things called rook scarers, right? And rook scarers used to come on a rope, right? You get a rope about so long. And then every f sort of four inches along this rope, there was this banger, this industrial-sized banger that could like blow the lid off a dustbin. I proved that, right? And, and, and what you did was you lit the rope, and once the rope started smoldering, the idea was that you could kind of put it in a field, and then every half hour or so, like this banger would go off and frighten all the crows and the farmer's crops would be. Or you could put it in a tunnel near where it was a highly kind of densely populated area at two o'clock in the morning, then light it, and then you could be confident in the knowledge that every half hour, every neighbour in the vicinity would be woken up. It was the gift that kept on giving. You know what I mean? It's fantastic. Or what you could do with these things is take them off a string and you could stick them in a telephone box or you could do the ones with, you know, like the gumball machines where you got like, like the, the, the bubble gums and you put, and it used to be like 2P or something. You put 2P in and you twist the thing to get your, your sweets. Or a couple of rook scarers, shove them in there, light them and run away. Boom! Sweets from heaven. It was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> What's that got to do with anything? Right. Okay, so, but you can get a firework out of a box. Okay. And you can hold it in your hand and it just looks, it's got the potential of, you know, sweets from heaven or, or, or a beautiful, you, you know, cascade of colour in the sky or, or a noise. But what, what's the difference? Like, you can get it and you shake it and nothing will happen. What it needs is a spark. It needs light. It needs, it needs fire. When you, when you add fire to that little firework, it's never the same again. And sometimes it takes a little while and it spits and starts and stuff for that little blue touch paper to start going. But when it goes, you can be confident that, you know, it, it's going to change. As, as believers, we, we like the box of, life is like a box of fireworks. You know, like, like, we, we like a box of fireworks that you just get out and, and, and we can all look the same. Okay, and the only difference between a firework that is going to explode and a firework that isn't is just a little bit of shiny, sparkly stuff at the top. But if God gets hold of a man's soul and his fire comes and lights the blue touch paper of your life, then it will explode. And bring, listen, when you follow Jesus, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you're not the completed article. Did you know that? I don't know if that happened to you, but when I prayed and asked Jesus into my life, I looked in the mirror and I looked just the same. And, and the next day I woke up and I thought I must have done something wrong because nothing changed. It just it seemed the same. But there was a little sparkling light above my head because the fire of God had fallen. I didn't feel any different and it didn't look any different and I kept messing up, but there will be a day that that life explodes. When Jesus takes hold of your life, when he lights that touch paper of your life, you're not going to be perfect, but there will be a day when you will. When Jesus will make all things new. When everything that's been wrong in the past will be made right. When every tear from every eye will be wiped. When the fire of God falls on a human soul, you can be sure that he will complete what he starts. Does that encourage you? Because it's, it's, I get depressed sometimes when you, when you look at yourself and think, I should be better by now. Why do I keep falling for that temptation? Why, why do I keep saying those sort of things? Well, I'm not perfect yet. But if God set light to me, there will be a day when that really 
will be. If his work is begun in you, it will be completed. You see, the Bible, it, it's not about you. <laughs> it just ain't. It's about God. It's about him and his goodness and his glory and how we fit underneath that. Not, not like a, a, a Bible that we pick up and shake and say, right, give me a magic verse today to make me feel better. It's not what it's for. It's about God. It helps us to lift our eyes to God, take our eyes off ourselves. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, the letter opens with. It's not Paul and Timothy, your bosses. It's, it's, I'm servant. It's all about him. I, I get to serve him. Well, I get to lead you people in serving him. My, my favorite joke, right? You ready for this? What's the difference between an oral and a rectal thermometer? The taste. The taste. When you go to the doctor and they take your temperature, they find out what's actually going on there, whether you're healthy or not. They take your pulse and they, they take your temperature and they take blood tests and all that and they find out what's really going on. Philippians is like a thermometer. that You stick under your tongue and you find out what's going on, what's really in there. Sometimes... Troubles and difficulties, they're, they're a means that God uses to show what God's done in there. Because sometimes troubles come and it reveals that there's no light there at all. Actually, you're just a firework and you need the fire of God. And as I was preparing this uh, 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 this week, I felt that God was saying that there's, there's people here that have prayed prayers in the past. Funny enough, I was talking to someone earlier on who, who was saying about a, a prayer he prayed to God years and years ago. And, and uh, there's, there's others in this room that have prayed prayers to God, saying, God, I really want to be right, or I really want to make a difference. I really want to I, I really bring life into the world. I really want to make a difference. I want to help people. I want to be right with God. No matter what the wording is, you know that there's been times in your life, even when you were little kids, when you prayed and really meant it. And it's like the firework was taken out of the box and there's a match nearby. And do you know what? I feel that Jesus wants to come and set light now. So that it's not you turning over new leaves and, and, and pulling your socks up and trying really hard, but you're calling out to a God that loves to breathe life into dead souls. And if you have prayed those prayers in the past, and you ain't got to dig around, you'll know if you've prayed that kind of thing. Actually, I feel like today is an opportunity to invite the Holy Spirit to come and set light to your soul. And as, as, I, as I finish here, I want to I wanna do that. I want to I give opportunity for us to respond. Maybe for the first time, maybe you need to do this as a public thing and say, do you know what, I'm, I'm doing this now. Those prayers I prayed as a little kid and I didn't know any better, but actually my heart was pure. I really did want to make a difference. I really did want to please you, God. Actually, there's an opportunity today to say, Lord, I'm yours. Please set light to me. Please put your fire in me. I'm not signing up for an easy life. Paul was writing with chains on his ankles. He wasn't saying, oh, come to Jesus. Everything's going to be terrific. He ain't. He's, he's saying, this is your, you expect troubles. Expect troubles. But when you have troubles, even those can be redeemed as an opportunity to bring much glory to him. Let's, let's pray. Let's just bow our heads where you are. Jesus, I, I thank you that you don't like sugarcoat stuff. And, and, and we love to... We love to put things on posters and take little snippets out. But, but the reality is, Jesus, some of your servants over the, over the centuries have suffered terribly for this faith that we now profess. And, and Jesus, we, we just want to say here and now, being good or bad, easy or difficult, we want to trust you, Lord. 
but we recognize that we can't do that with our own sort of strength of character because we'll never keep it up. So, dear Holy Spirit, I pray that you would send your fire now and set light to us. Jesus, you, you, you've heard those prayers over the years that people have prayed about wanting to be right with you, about wanting to make a difference in the world. Holy Spirit, I pray now would you come and just put a match to that. And, and, and I pray that, that there will be people here that, that even if they've been coming to church and, and they look like a firework and they, they sound like a firework, but, but there's no life there. Lord, I pray that you would come now and, and, and bring that new life, bring that fire, that fruit would come even in the most difficult of situations, that our, our sort of reaction would be to quickly say, how can I glorify you in this? I don't, I don't need to win this argument, Lord. I want, to, I want to live in a way that pleases you more than winning an argument. Jesus, I pray that you would... You'd save souls today. You'd start a work in people's lives today. That there would be people that could respond honestly and in reality and say, Lord, from this day forward, no matter what it costs, I want you to come and live in my life. I want you to come and take my life. I want you to put your fire in my life. Jesus, we're not asking you just to give us tingly feelings. We're asking you to take a hold of these dead souls and birth new life in them so that you can be glorified through thick and thin. Let's just wait in God's presence a minute. Just keep your eyes closed if you don't mind. If you know that you've, no matter what anyone else around you thinks, in this room, it, it, it's, it ain't going to matter because there's going to come a day when you're going to stand alone before the King of Kings. And if you're here today and you know that you've never responded personally to Jesus, as I said, Lord, my life is yours. Please let me start again. Or words to that effect. If you know you've never done that, I just would like to invite you just to put your hand up now and say, Lord... Today's the day. I want, I want that life. I want to know why I'm alive. If you've never done that, put your hand up in the air right now, please. It's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. There's a few hands going out. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Put your hands down. I, I, I'd love to speak to you afterwards. But Jesus, I, I thank you that you meet us where we're at. Thank you. You know what you're taking on. We we ain't coming to you with all our expertise and knowing what's what, and and we're coming as learners and saying, Jesus, through thick and thin, through rich and poor, through sickness and in health, oh God, Lord, we trust you to lead us. And and we, we commit this this book, this study to you, this term, and pray, oh God that you would not just help us to grin and bear stuff, but there will be an unquenchable joy that bubbles up in our souls through thick and thin that brings you all the glory. For Jesus' sake, amen.